Howdy. Welcome to Osgrave Royalty. I am Justin. This is an exciting day. Glad you stopped by. We are starting the kickoff of the video series regarding archetypes by Dr. Anthony Stevens, the book, as well as kicking off the first season of Osgrave Royalty ever. I'm a new YouTuber, for those who don't already know. And also the first video in a larger series of books on archetypal psychology as a whole, beginning with Archetypes by Dr. Anthony Stevens. <clears throat> for example, next we'll be talking about King, Warrior, Magician, Lover by Robert L. Moore. So look forward to that. Anyway, like I said, uh, I'm Justin from Osgrave Royalty. If you want to know some about what this channel is all about and where I'm coming from, there'll be some videos in the description uh, for that. And I, I have some like about me videos and about the channel, how we, how we tentatively do things here. Uh, by we, I mean me for now. But just a tiny little bit of background, since it's still the early days. Um, I have a background in philosophy. I have a bachelor's degree. And I don't say that, again, for any sort of intellectual authority on any, any matter at all. I'm just saying that's the context I'm coming from. That's where my interests are. That's how I was, like, I guess intellectually trained, for lack of a better term. And the main impetus for me creating this channel and this series is really just a wildly unashamed, selfish desire to introduce people to ideas that they may not have heard of before, and maybe it'll help in interpret some of the events in their lives. Uh, S Stefan Molyneux said that the past isn't the past until it's dealt with. I really like that. So archetypal psychology to me <clears throat> offers a, a little bit more of an unbiased approach to self-examination. And yeah, um, this is technically the second video in the series. I have uh, some editorial notes about this particular, how I'm going to do the series for this book as a whole as a whole and how I'll cover it throughout the various parts there's 11 parts in total including like the intro and the conclusion video but um yeah enough uh, enough stalling uh, enough housekeeping but you know i just this is the first kind of meat and potatoes video of the series so i just wanted to make sure everyone's on the same page uh before we really kick it off, which we are going to do right now. Again, these ideas, you know, take what is useful and discard the rest. That's my motto. <clears throat> so, and don't take my word for anything. Please look all this up. Uh, I'm just a fan. I want to, I want to talk to you like I'd talk to like an acquaintance. You know, this is not an academic lecture. We're just, we're just chilling. <clears throat> so, in this video, in particular, we'll be talking about Dr. Stevens' origin story. <laughs> he could be a Marvel, Marvel hero. This is um, <clears throat> about, and really his origin story is our origin story. It's the, what he went through as a doctoral student researching attachment theory and then into archetypes and uh, contending with behavior behaviorism, which was popular at the time in academia. It's really our journey in how we, how we would, ar how anyone might arrive at the archetypal theory. And it's important to examine that because archetypal theory it has a like a new agey grimy taste to it like 
archetypes? What are they? Are they like crystals? Are they like spirits? You know, <laughs> um, it's y- you sort of think of the word archetype and nothing really comes to mind. You know, maybe you've heard of like king, warrior, magician, lover, and you're you're thinking, is there a little king in my head? Like, what does that mean? What does that even mean in reality? You know. <clears throat> but I'm here to tell you that Anthony Steve and I hope I do this justice, but uh, if I do my job correctly, I mean, there's some pretty profound stuff here. And just to rant on a little bit about this and indulge myself, you know that uh, there's like a 90s action movie trope where like two individuals, they ha- each have a piece of this key and they're unlocking something extraordinary and profound, like <laughs> the MacGuffin or something. And it's like on three, one, two, and they simultaneously unlock the thing, right? This epic thing. This is what it feels like, uh, like these ideas that we're about to get into. This is like really powerful stuff. And I've I mentioned in other videos that I've recorded that may or may not be out at the time, um, that like how we self-examine and how we interpret the world is kind of like an inbuilt software, like an app, you know, that gets updated. It can do things. And we have this, these different ways of viewing the world. And Ayn Rand talked a little bit about this, what she called psychoepistemology. It's just, it's like my glasses. It's like how we view the world, the, the assumptions that we carry in our psyche that offer, that give us readily available, often inaccurate explanations, which are useful for survival um, when you're quickly trying to interpret things going on around you. But um, yeah, this is um, the fact that this isn't more popular archetypal psychology is, a, is a, sends a chill down my spine, honestly. Um, but better late than never. And I'm paying it forward. Damn it. You know, I started a whole channel, uh, to talk about this stuff. So yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm interested to, to hear from y'all in the comments below what y'all think about all this stuff. So, <laughs> oh my God. Uh, that was a huge preamble, but let's get started. So yeah. The origin story of Dr. Anthony Stevens and how he arrived at the archetypal theory. So, we're oh, computer alert. Uh, hashtag YouTube noob. All right. So, it's the 1960s. Bowlby, sorry. Um, <laughs> spoiler alert. Uh, Dr. Anthony Stevens is at the Materian Baby Center in Greece in 1966, and I have notes in front of me, by the way. Um, basically, this is a it's a care center for infants, like unwanted um, children and or abandoned children, and there are about a hundred of them. And there's a like re- a team of nurses. I think it's a there were a hundred nurses as well. Let me check. Yeah, so. an army of substitute mothers caring for these infants. Kind of a unique, uh, unique idea there. So like I said, at the time, behaviorism ruled the academic circles and, but Dr. Anthony Stevens is here, uh, studying, uh, attachment theory, which is, which we'll talk about in a moment, which was, uh, first originated by Dr. John Bowlby. And so more about the the center. Um, So all these nurses collectively, it's sort of like a, some kind of communist gobbledygook of mothering, as Norm would say. Um, But all these nurses made rounds and there, there were assigned nurses for the various infants. But if like 
there was an infant that needed care nearby, then any nurse would, would attend to their needs. So, you know, it, it wasn't uh, the assigned nurse, yes, was typically there, but often it would just be any nurse who happened to be there. So the fact that they had an assigned nurse was more of a formality than strictly enforced. It was really about nearest nurse gives the nearest needy infant care, right? So again, we talked about behaviorism being the prevailing thing, that behaviorism cites that we're born tabula rasa and all everything is learned. Like, and specifically for these purposes, that mothers and the mother infant bond is learned between them. The infant, they, they learn to get mother's attention because she has the food and the resources needed for survival. So the infant begins kind of learning, learning to get the mother's attention to, to maximize that. And this was called the cupboard love theory at the time that mothers were like cupboards, like going to the cupboard to get some food, you know, and um, that mothers and infants were operating on uh, what's called operant conditioning, basically rewards and punishments, behaviors that, um, yeah, behavior was kind of molded so that each got what the other needed. And that's how the bond eventually gets uh, formalized. So Dr. John Bowlby comes along and says, no, actually there's an inbuilt instinct in babies that per that <laughs> I I'm laughing because <laughs> academics would, I'm putting myself in the 1960s. I mean, nothing's really changed. It's funny how history repeats that there's always like the punk rock academics upsetting like the boomer academics who are setting their ways. And I, I get it. Imagine doing all that research and then it's all, you know, invalidated. That must be frustrating, but you got to have the maturity, especially in any, in t any intellectual endeavor to be able to bend and not break with new new uh new research you know but anyway uh yeah bulby comes along and says no uh this is nonsense um i'm paraphrasing there um that rather there's an instinct an inbuilt readiness for infants to bond with the mothers and vice versa nature has prepared us psychologically psychobiologically like we have the biological structures already that prepare us for the bond that's about to take place that we're primed for that that nature expects the infant to encounter and we'll get in into this a lot more later but just that is 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 huge okay and yeah, Bowlby called it instinct, which is like uh, an extremely vulgar word in academia um, because it, it, it's a lot like archetypes, like, oh, instinct, you know, it, it's vague. It's, you know, it's like spiritual. Uh, but yeah, uh, Bowlby asserted uh, there is no, forget this tabula rasa nonsense that we're just, we don't know we're born. We don't know what the hell we're doing. We're completely zeroed out no default apps installed, so to speak. Bowlby says, no, there are some default apps, metaphorically. One of those apps is the mother bonding app. And, you know, we have, we can utilize that. Oh man, this, my inner snob cringes at this 21st century metaphor here, but you know, here it is. So moving on, Stevens remarks that uh, the academic com community was not thrilled with what Bowlby had to say and that fury was the response, not uh, <laughs> appreciation. But Bowlby came up with these ideas from the field of ethology, ethology, E-T-H-O-L-O-G-Y, which is the study of organisms in their natural habitats. And 
it's funny, Bowlby remarked like to the behaviorists, y'all have no problem citing the behaviors of other mammals and primates as instinctive, but we're mammals. So why not us? Why can't we have instincts? So Stevens is mulling all this over. And if the behaviorists were correct, then infants should be bonding with any given nurse that gives them food, you know, the, the cupboard love theory, right? So there'd be attachments formed with all these various nurses. But if Bowlby was correct, then we should find that um, there's probably only one nurse or very few that the infants would actually have a bond with. And Bowlby called this monotropy, which is the tendency for behaviors to orient themselves around an individual or small group rather than just anybody who mirrored the right behaviors for operant conditioning. So Stephen says, within six months, I had collected enough data to establish beyond doubt that far from becoming attached to all their nurses, three quarters of the children became specifically attached to one nurse who was preferred way above all the rest, even by the strictest statistical criteria, allowing for the small size of the sample. Bowlby's monotropic principle was confirmed. He noticed that infants decided on their nurse by eight or nine months and get ready for this. Infants often became attached to nurses that never even interacted with them initially. Wow. That's huge. Okay. Let me say that again. He noticed that infants decided on their nurse by eight or nine months. Okay. And so Infants often became attached to nurses that never even interacted with them initially, okay? Furthermore, only in very few cases did the infant actually bond with the mother nurse assigned to them. He says, one cannot legislate matters of the heart. Ah, oh. <laughs> I mentioned in the intro video that one of the reasons I chose this book was just Stevens is an incredible writer. It's like, it's just great prose. And I, I, I said this in the last video that um, clarity, in in, clarity in writing when it comes to complex matters is, uh, is just, it's integrity. It shows you care about your reader and you care about your message well enough to make your writing very clear and even profound, like simply simple and profound. Um, and Stevens is just, he's a breath of fresh air. And I've read some, uh, some gobbledygook in my day being a philosophy guy, looking at you, Emmanuel Kant. Anyway, so one cannot legislate matters of the heart. This was devastating for the cupboard love theory, of course, it's not just who has the food, you know? Um, yeah, so it turns out play and other social interactions mattered more. And he says, the whole process was more akin to falling in love through mutual delight and attraction rather than operant conditioning. In any, so again, this tabula rasa thing, uh, doesn't appear, it, it appears to um, not hold. And uh, I, I'm getting ahead, but Stevens does mention later, or when it comes to the mother-child bond, he said, and this is about, so if <laughs> if you're like me, when I read this, I'm thinking, is it really just about, is this really just about infants and babies? Because if you know anything about attachment theory and go see the personal development school, I, I plug this all the time. Uh, say that like a YouTube veteran. I've recorded a few videos before this. Um, but go, I'll have a link in the description, the personal development school channel ran, run by Thais Gibson. She's just incredible at articulating the nuances of attachment theory, anxious attachment, 
uh, anxious avoidant, fearful avoidant, and the secure attachment style, and how really we should be looking for love partners in terms of uh, attachment compatibility rather than anything else. I'm grossly oversimplifying everything there. Go, please go check it out for yourself. But yeah, Stevens, you know, the, the mother child bond catalyzes the ego consciousness and defines one's self sense of self identity in the child. And the bond with the mother often reflects the security that one, one feels when they go out into the world. And th this is something Molyneux talked about as well. Stefan Molyneux that like how, you know, when people say like, Oh, the world, you know, isn't fair or, ah, oh, it's, you know, only the powerful, you know, whatever. Everyone has their, their old, you know, old timey phrase, you know, and typically, and this is this, um, mother child bond potential about the uh, sense of security in the world and what Molyneux is talking about. Yeah. It has to do with your upbringing. So if w when you're young, when you're an infant, your parents are your world, you know? So if your parental life was extremely chaotic, yeah, of course you're going to expect that life is chaotic, right? If you had a decent upbringing, you know, you're not, you don't come out cynical, you know, and you get it. Uh, and yeah, let me know in the comments below what you think about that. This is just like when I, when I was reading this, it's like revelation after revelation. And I've encountered these ideas before, but nowhere like in, in this concentrated dose and so well put and, and the most important thing where all these thoughts fit into a cohesive whole a whole paradigm that one can draw on to explore all sorts of facets of the human condition. And that's what got me to fall in love with archetypal psychology as a whole. So yeah, he says, Stephen says, we love life in as much as love was present in our first great affair. Oh. And that's the mother child bond. I love that. And uh, yeah, it just, it reminds me of, uh, there's a song uh, by the Juliana Theory. And I forgot which one, what it's called, but uh, there's some lyrics that went, life is love or lack thereof. Life is love or lack thereof. I love that. Um, so... While Bowlby's ideas of the attachment theory took step, steps forward, um, Stevens started to have like a, a sinking feeling that there's something more. So even Bowlby is still looking at the behaviors, right? And Stevens is at this point getting a sense that there, this isn't, there's got to be something more to the actual experience of what's going on with the attachment. By concentrating on the behavioral process through which attachments are formed, it is easy to forget that the child does not experience his mother as a mere behavioral sequence with punishing or rewarding attributes, but as a person, an indispensable other with recognizable features and personality characteristics which are uniquely precious to him. For a mother, the joy she experiences when her infant stares at her, smiles, and makes rapid movements with arms and legs is no illusion. Indeed, for many a woman, such moments are the happiest fulfillment of her life. Who are we to tell her that her pleasure is the consequence of a confidence trick played on her by nature in order to ensure the survival of her child? We must never forget that the actual experience of attachment and the symbolic implications of the mother-child relationship reach far beyond mere behavioral systems in the neurophysical mechanisms responsible for their control. So what happens next? This is, these are the thoughts that led Stevens to 
bring bring what he was mulling over to his Jungian a- analyst, Irene uh, Champeron, and run the ideas by her. And she said, and um, there's a, yeah. So she said, this is crucial. Archetypes are biological entities that evolved by natural selection and that they are responsible for much of our behavior as they are for the behavior of other mammalian and primate species, and that in human beings the archetype had achieved their highest expression in the production of culture and human consciousness. So we've... Stevens went through the research about, you know, looking at these infants and how they attached. And established that there's more to the bond than mere operant conditioning. That led to the fact that if that's true, then tabula rasa is null and void. So what what are the nature of these inbuilt structures? What are they? And Stevens had encountered the theory of archetypes by Carl Jung, who was not taken seriously at the time. And yeah, that this bringing these ideas to his analyst, Irene, uh, this, this really set the stage for Stevens and how he'd move forward, um, and which largely culminated in the book we're covering right now. So this is very important. Not Even for, archetypes are important here. But it's large, we're largely talking about the bigger issue of psychology being taken seriously. That if this is true, that archetypes and there's inbuilt structures that arise biologically that we're already pre-wired for, then, then archetypes themselves are products of evolution. Now that's, uh, that's something to think about. And, you know, luckily... We'll be exploring just that trail of thought with Stevens here. That's why we're here. So, to be clear, Stevens makes the observation that Jung's archetypes are not the same as the behaviors that the archetypes give rise to. And I, I, I say, like, it's the difference between checking off things on our to do list versus having the concept of a to do list at all, right? Jung's assertion that the archetype does not denote an inherent I, ugh, Jung's assertion that the archetype does not denote an inherited idea but rather an inherent mode of functioning was biologically unimpeachable and that has to do with these inbuilt psychological biopsychological structures and we'll get into more of that in the next video uh, <laughs> epic segue so that will conclude our first entry into Archetypes by Dr. Anthony Stevens. Already, things are being shaken up in, in the psychological realm. And if you ask me, this is better than half the Marvel origin stories, just bringing that full circle. But I appreciate y'all for sticking with me. Hope y'all got value out of this. And I will see y'all in the next one. Useful links below. Bye-bye.